Okay, so maybe before I uh, start with new material, I should uh, recall a little bit wh where we stopped last time. So actually, what I presented last time were the main arguments of Ladenford proofs. Okay. So actually, there were three important ingredients. Okay, and these ingredients we will, of course, still use them in the in the next developments, but, but we will see that actually they are not enough. So the first one was to project on the finite dimensional uh, uh, subspace of the, the phase space. Okay, so that's uh, uh, just uh, this story of looking at correlation function that were also introduced by uh, at the quantum level by um, in the other uh, courses. Okay, so that's really a uh, the idea of a finite dimensional projection. Okay, so that's that then then we wrote the equation for this correlation function. I will not uh, uh, rewrite everything, but this is what is called the BBGKY hierarchy. I should uh, at least uh, write at least once this this uh, this thing. Okay, so then, uh, uh, as was already uh, and done in many uh, situations, also for uh, this uh, random Schrodinger equation and for many other uh, things in this, this uh, uh, limit of system of particles, we use this iterative domain formula, so we have this series expansion. And I recall that this, this series expansion is responsible for the short time restriction. Okay, so that's why we get this short time restriction. So this is just a deterioration of two amena. Okay, and then the next uh, and actually uh, last argument was this geometric representation of each elementary term in this series expansion. Okay, so we have a lot of terms, and so essentially uh, the, the 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 index here is just the number of particles that we uh, uh, have to add uh, to to just uh, trace back the history of one particle. Okay. And so this, this geometric representation is uh, very uh, useful because it, it allows to compare uh, the, the original dynamics with fixed epsilon with the limiting dynamics where epsilon is equal to zero. Okay, and then we get the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so that's, so the last argument here is geome ge this geometric representation. And one thing which is important is that, of course, th these are not uh, trajectories. Uh, of uh, the real dynamics, but just pseudo trajectories. So that's just a way of of just um, understanding this series expansion. But this is not uh, this doesn't correspond exactly to uh, real trajectories of particles. Okay. So now you see that. Uh, so that's uh, good because actually with these three arguments, what you can prove is that for short time. Uh, the Boltzmann equation is, uh, can be obtained as the uh, law of large numbers for uh, this uh, system of odd spheres. Okay, but of course this uh, short time limitation is uh, very bad from a physical point of view because I m maybe uh, uh, have to mention that uh, say the typical time that you can reach here is just a fraction of the mean free time. Okay, so essentially you don't see you just see a, a, a couple of so less than one uh, collision per particle in average. So th that's still a lot of collision because you have a lot of particles, but you see that it's not really a collision model. And in particular, you will never see relaxation towards equilibrium and fluid limits. Okay, so that's, that's uh, really uh, the main uh, problem with this, this proof by Lanford. And so there is a very natural question, which is to extend this, this convergence for uh, longer times. Okay, so that's the question that I, I would like to uh, uh, right now, and um, maybe before I start with a uh, possible answer in some particular case, I should explain why it's not so obvious to remove this this uh, this uh, restriction. Okay, so uh, actually I mentioned it, but that um, uh, you see that this proof actually doesn't see the signs. 
at any point. Okay, so all the terms, so some of them are have minus sign, others have plus sign, but you just deal with them. So when you try to have this a priori estimate here, you just look at all the terms and take plus sign. Okay, so this, so so a first, so the so the first problem is that we do not see any compensation between gain and loss term. So compensations between gain and loss terms are not taken into account. Now, if you look at the Boltzmann equation, which is the limiting object, okay, and you just forget that you have a, a minus sign. Okay, so you just write the gain term, for instance, or just the, the sum of the gain term and the, 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 the loss term. Then you see that what you have in x is just in the right-hand side. Okay, maybe I should rewrite this equation. So you have a term uh, with the transport, but say, for the moment, I just don't care. Okay, so you have something like this. Maybe I just forget about this. This will not be really a problem here. Okay, you just can uh, uh, conjugate by the by the transport operator, and that's fine. And then you have this 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 uh, collision term. So I just recall that it's something like so. I should write x v prime f of x v prime one minus f of x v f of x v one. Okay, and then you have uh, this uh, cross section v minus v one dot omega d v one d omega. Okay, so I, I don't care uh, about the, the problem of large velocities here. Just, just would like to focus on this uh, term here. You see that that's just a product in X. Okay, so what you, you should have in mind is that this equation actually is some, like something much simpler, which is like DTU equal U square. If you forget about the sign here, you see that you have just a product, and so you have an equation like this. Okay, and this equation, of course, you know that it will blow up for finite time. And actu actually, this Lanford time is more or less this time where this equation will blow up. Okay, so if you don't take into account the sign, then essentially you are dead. Okay, you cannot go uh, for longer times. Okay, and so and actually a remark is that even uh, close to equilibrium, you are not able to take into account the fact that you are uh, at equilibrium and that actually this now, now the compensation is just exact. Okay, so that's that's really uh, uh, the bad thing with the um, this proof here. Okay, and so uh, it's not completely clear how we can uh, improve this uh, this kind of argument. Okay. Um, say one thing which is really uh, classical in in problem of singular penalization in analysis would be to try to use the fact that you know something on the limiting equation, okay, and to try to use this structure uh, uh, just to, to to understand better uh, uh, the original system. But here it's complicated because you cannot expect to have any strong convergence. You see that the Boltzmann equation. So that's the the next problem actually is that the convergence cannot hold in a very strong sense. Okay, so you cannot choose kind of stability around uh, the, the limiting system, which would be the case actually for min field. So for min field, you can imagine to have entropic methods to prove the convergence. Here, you cannot have something like this. Okay, so uh, convergence cannot hold in a very strong sense, so something like entropic. And the reason is it's just simple. So the, you see that, uh, of course, you start from an Hamiltonian system, so all entropies, all quantities like this are just conserved. Okay, If you just look at the entropy, it's conserved. And this is not the case for the Boltzmann equation. Okay, So you don't expect uh, the, the two systems to be close to each other in, in entropy because one has constant entropy and the other one has a decreasing entropy. Okay, so that's not just possible. Okay, so this means that actually, in when you do take limits, you really lose a macroscopic part of the information, and so any strong convergence like this is actually forbidden. 
Okay, so that's, that tells you that it's not, it's not clear how you can use what you know on this, on this Boltzmann equation. Okay, so, and so maybe a last comment is, is about what, what can we do just to prove that this equation has a solution, okay, because maybe it could be an idea to try to uh, use the same kind of things um, at the microscopic level. And so actually you have two types of, of solution for this Boltzmann equation. Okay, so the first one is, um, is, is just, uh, uh, say, a smooth solution close to equilibrium. Okay, and then a very important thing is that uh, you have that the linearized operator is, um, is uh, actually a contraction. Okay, but then you see that you are back to this problem that at the, at the uh, microscopic level, you don't expect to have any contraction. Okay, so that's bad. And say uh, the other, uh, uh, so, so that's the, the, the first, so actually you have three uh, ways of constructing a solution to the Boltzmann equation. The first one is to do something like this, okay, and that's exactly what you do uh, when you uh, construct solution in land force proof. Okay, the third, uh, the, the second one is, is close to equilibrium to use this kind of smoothness plus uh, this uh, contraction. And the third one is the one introduced by Deep and Lyons using uh, renormalization. Okay, but then it also uh, relies uh, very strongly on uh, the entropy inequality. Okay, so that's really uh, something that you have to understand is, say, what will play the role of this information, of this entropy, and, and, and so that's, if you would like to, to understand something in the nonlinear case, then you really have to uh, understand this, this, this question of information in the microscopic system. Okay, so that's not, not what I uh, will do, just because I don't know how to do that. I, I would like to be able, but I don't know. Okay, and so here what I will do actually is to look at a simpler problem, just uh, close to equilibrium. Okay, so now uh, what I, so this is the third part, and I will uh, introduce a weak convergence method. And what is important here is that it's close to equilibrium. But maybe uh, there is, okay, I still hope that we can maybe use this notion of weak convergence uh, even a bit further from equilibrium, but uh, that's another story. Okay, so here the idea is that, okay, it's too complicated to look at this uh, correlation function. They are very uh, bad, and actually we saw last time that the uh, two problems that can arise are the fact that at some point you have too many collisions and that's the reason why maybe the series will not be convergence just because the i order terms will be too large okay and the other problem comes from uh, this uh, geometric representation here we saw that at some point we uh, can be very far from the Boltzmann dynamics just because we have this kind of uh, loops or cycles uh, in the collision graph and then and then uh, that's another reason why uh, this, this uh, uh, correlation function may be actually uh, uh, bad in the sense that they will be uh, far from uh, the limiting uh, object. Okay, so here uh, the idea in this uh, weak convergence is to uh, just forget about uh, correlation function and just look at moments. Okay, so... Um, So here now, uh, as we are close to equilibrium, of course, we are not interested in, in just the um, uh, law of large number, but at the next order correction, which is the fluctuation field. Okay, so here what I will look at are the moment of the fluctuation field. Of course, if we would like to do something like this, say, uh, out of equilibrium, the first uh, stage, first step, would be to look at moments of the, uh, just of the, the moments of the, um, just the expectation, okay? just moments of the empirical measure, not on, on the fluctuation field. But here, so the, the, the relevant quantity close to equilibrium is the fluctuation field. Okay, so um, what it does it mean? Is it just mean that, so I just recall uh, uh, the definition of this uh, fluctuation field. 
So this is uh, a random uh, field which is defined by duality, so meaning that I uh, look at uh, its action on any test function, okay? And this will be just a square root of mu epsilon, which is the um, uh, times one over mu epsilon, the sum for i equal one to n. So I recall that mu epsilon is the typical number, the average number of particles, and n is just in one realization the number of the total number of particles because I am in the grand canonical setting. Okay, so z i of t minus the expectation under the same uh, under the uh, so here it will be the Gibbs measure. Okay, of uh, this this h. Okay, so here I look at everything under the Gibbs measure. Maybe I should recall what, what it is for those of you who were not here last time. So it's just uh, you have this normalization function, with, uh, which is the partition function, and then you have mu epsilon to the k divided by factorial k. Then you have the exponential of minus one half of the sum of i square, okay, maybe I should call this n to be correct. And then you have, uh, uh, so this just encodes the special exclusion that particles have to be at distance epsilon from each other. Okay, so that's, that's uh, the fluctuation field, okay. So that's the empirical measure. I just uh, subtract here the expectation, and then I uh, uh, normalize by this factor square root of mu epsilon, since this, this is uh, what we expect to be uh, uh, the relevant process to have a, a limit when mu epsilon tends to uh, plus infinity. Okay, so now what I say is that I will not try to uh, describe this correlation function, but just moments of this quantity here. So just I'm interested in the expectation of just a product, a finite product of things like this. Okay, so T1 of H1, epsilon T, say P of HP. Okay, I take products of this and then I'm interested in this, this quantity here. Okay, so uh, you see that um, it's a weaker of some, somehow it's it's weaker because we don't need so uh, you know that this notion of convergence actually we we, we had a, a, a lecture yesterday about this different notion of co of convergence but you see that this this is somehow if you take just one time or two times it's much weaker uh, that, than than the convergence of correlation function okay because you see that. You can have a lot of pathological things which happen, but with a probability which is almost zero, and so they will not contribute to the expectation, and so you don't want and don't need to describe them, okay? But on the other end, it's a bit uh, better than the correlation function because you can look at a lot of different times, okay? So if you would like to look at the, the convergence of the process, of the whole process, of course, it's better than just looking at one time, okay? So that's, that's say, it's uh, a weaker convergence, but on the other end, uh, uh, we have um, we have uh, many different times. And so which is important for the convergence of the process. Can I ask if you <coughs> know this for all p yes. convergence? Yes. Say just at the same times. Would you then would that imply the convergence of correlation functions? If I uh, uh, no. Still not. No. No, no. You cannot uh, go back to to the correlation function. And actually, I don't think that the, the convergence of the correlation function for this very large time is true, because we really remove a lot of things. You don't think it's true for no? Oh, I see. At least you see that. Okay, maybe I should have said in which in which uh, a functional space this convergence holds, because of course this everything. Uh, of course, in L one, I guess that it will be convergent because more or less you see that. Okay, if I just put here two times, 
then more or less it will be tells you that say it's essentially the integral of the correlation function against this function. So it will tell you that in weak L1 or in the sense of measure, you uh, get something like the convergence of this, this correlation function. But say usually in Lanford proof, this is not at all the kind of functional space that you look at. So you look at uh, at spaces like uh, L infinity with uh, exponential weight, mm -hmm. which are much stronger. Mm -hmm. And here, I, I would say that, OK, if you just take two times, because of course, here, uh, as you are under, under the invariant measure, just one time is not very interesting. Everything is invariant. So if you take two times, uh, it will tell you something on the, uh, on the, on the correlation function. And OK, my impression is that should tell you something like a convergence in the sense of measure, which is, OK, much weaker. OK, so that's. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I kind of I think I missed one point. Yeah. So so the z i is a trajectory, right? Uh, yeah, uh, a real trajectory of the uh, yeah. And we are so we are so we are grand canonical. So yes. Um, why is the sum only going to n? Because in the grand canonical setting, so n here is uh, is the total number of particles. So this number, of course, so you have different. Uh, uh, so you have actually a superposition of initial data with different number of particles, which is given here by this capital N. But you see that for any realization, this sum is going until N. So this N is, is a random variable. It's still a random variable here. Ah, still random, okay. And then I sum over all possible N with this, this measure here. But say for one realization, N is then in fix. Uh, I have just a finite number of particles. Sorry. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the correlation functions are, are strictly stronger than this, or I mean, or you you can reconstruct this uh, expectation, or you have the problem that at different times you cannot actually. I mean, if you know all the correlation functions, do you know this expectation? No, uh, no, not not the usual correlation function. Then you can you can introduce some biased correlation function where essentially each time that you have uh, something like this, you introduce a bias on the correlation function, and then you can. Uh, says something, but this, these are kind of very generalized uh, correlation function. General correlation function that just go from one time where you have a, a, a distribution to another time. But of course, if, if you just do uh, this step by step and each time you uh, reach uh, the end of the step, then uh, you introduce a bias, then of course this is still a correlation function, but this is not what people usually call a correlation function. Okay, so that's the quantity that I will call uh, IP here. OK, and now, of course, uh, OK, I said that uh, I would like to study this quantity, but I have to do something, OK? So um, the idea now is, is to use, actually, not to uh, just forget about all this, but just to use this on very small time intervals, OK? Because still, it's a very nice description of, of the dynamics, OK? It tells you something on what happens on small time intervals. OK, but actually not time intervals of the size of Lanford, but even smaller time intervals. And then, and then uh, I will use this elementary step and just uh, do a lot of iteration. OK, so that's really uh, uh, the, the, the thing that we have in mind. OK, so let me uh, just explain. So I have this, I start from this, OK. And I would like, OK, to um, have all, of course, if I have all the, so if all the time here are equal, then because the, uh, uh, I, I compute everything under the invariant measure, then it's like computing everything at time zero, and then I know very well what happens. Okay, so if all times are equal, then I'm very happy because this is just a, a statistical physics at equilibrium, and this is very well known uh, for a very long time. Okay, because you just have to understand uh, the, the role of the, of the uh, exclusion, but what you expect essentially is that um, with the scaling here, with the Boltzmann grad scaling, the exclusion actually is, is something which is negligible. So you can just imagine, okay, it's not true, of course, you have a lot of work to, to do, but, but essentially what you can uh, have in mind is that if all time here are equal, okay, then uh, you can just forget about the, the small correlation which are due to this, the spatial exclusion, okay, to the stationary exclusion. And then computing uh, this uh, thing is just like computing this under the Gibbs measure without the exclusion. Okay, then this is something that you know very well. This is just everything is Gaussian. Everything is uh, 
Okay, so now the, the, the thing that I would like to do is to uh, just uh, pull back actually this, this observable in order that everything is at the same time. Okay, so that's the, uh, the goal. It's to pull back uh, the fluctuation uh, field. in order to uh, have just one time. Okay, so I can start with just I2, which is the, the, the covariance, okay? And then, uh, of course, the, the method will be uh, more or less the same. So it's just a covariance. Maybe I should uh, call it covariance. So of, say, H1, H2. And of course, the only thing which is important is just T2 minus T1 because everything is uh, um, uh, invariant by this uh, spatial translation, which will be the expectation of zeta, say, 0, h1, okay, t1 and t2, but that's really the same. Okay, so now what I would like to do is to pull back this one until uh, t2 is equal to t1, okay? So um, that's what I would like to write, okay? That's it's equal to zeta of h1 times uh, so something which is a bit more complicated, okay, but which still have the structure of a fluctuation, okay, and that I will uh, define right now, but which has, of course, uh, more. Um, go back on this. Um, Okay, so now you see that, f at, say here, I didn't use at all the fact that I'm, I am at equilibrium. Okay, so th this could be true for any distribution. I, I, I don't use here that I am in equilibrium. So now I will use that I am at equilibrium just to control these remainders. Okay, so that's really important. Here I will use the invariant measure and time decoupling. Okay, so that's maybe the, the first thing that I can do is, is to explain uh, what happens in the case of this conditioning, okay? And actually, we will see that essentially each time that I have something which is, which is uh, uh, pathological but localized in time, then I will be fine. Okay, so you see that what I would like to say is that actually this expectation, okay, here I should have uh, written so in order that it's an inequality, it's equality, I have to uh, add this, this conditioning. Okay. Okay, so you see that what I, I'm able to do is to, to, uh, to pull back the observables provided, provided that I have this conditioning. And so I have to understand whether this conditioning will uh, modify uh, the... Uh, so what I would like to... Look, it's uh, something like this, and prove that this is almost zero, okay? Because this conditioning, it was not in the original variance. I add it in order to be able to use this duality, but say it's not something that, that was present in the original covariance. Okay, so now what I say is that what is very, very good with this invert measure, you see that, of course, it doesn't depend on time, that's the, de the definition of the invert measure. And so what I can do is just to use the Alder inequality for this. And so what I will say is that this will be smaller than the expectation of t type epsilon t1 h1, say to the power 4, for instance, 1 fourth, the expectation of this other guy here. And now the expectation of 1 minus this guy to the 1 half. Okay? And so what is very, very good here is that you see that now you have just one time. Okay? So estimating this, this thing is, is simple. It's just uh, the est this estimate at, uh, say, under the equilibrium measure of the fluctuation field. It's stationary 
Okay, so that's, that's actually if h1 is in L infinity, for instance, this is finite. Depends only on, say, h1 in L infinity. Actually, probably uh, it's not optimal even, but okay. So that's, if you have a nice test function, then that's fine. Okay, the same for this one, of course. And so the only thing that I have to do is to prove that this guy will be small. Okay, and so that's, of course, uh, now you have a geometric lemma here to prove that uh, this, this uh, microscopic cluster cannot be uh, too many. Okay, and so this, this will uh, converge to zero. So with this, this additional condition that, and actually not only this one, but so now you see that you have to remove all these small clusters at a lot of time because you have one over delta times where you have to uh, remove these this, uh, bad things. But even with this one over delta, this will converge to zero, provided that you have, okay, that you have uh, chosen your gamma in a suitable way. Okay, so for this gamma, I think gamma is equal to 40, but if I, I don't give the proof, it's not really uh, useful to, to give this gamma. But okay, for gamma large enough, you can prove that this will converge to zero, even with this one over delta. Okay, so that's, so what, what, what I would like to uh, uh, show you with this estimate is that actually that uh, um, it's really simple to uh, control remainders Provided that you can, so you have this other inequality, you use then the invariant measure. And the last thing that you use is that, say, the pathological things happen for, uh, it's, it's localized in time. Okay, so what is important is that the pathological behavior is localized in time. So here you see that I, I just I just have my time interval here. So this is T1, this is T2. I I just have a lot of so small interval of size delta. And at each of this time, I just uh, remove all these microscopic clusters which are bigger than ga gamma plus one. Okay? And so what I say is that if gamma is, is large enough, then of course you see that having a, a cluster like this. It's, it's really complicated, and so then you see that, okay. Okay, so that's, that's the point, and then you say that, uh, say, say, each time it's localized because it's at one time, okay? And then you take just a union bone, and, uh, and then you're, you're, you're done, okay? So now you see that I would like to remove other things, which will be more complicated, and so typically there are two other things that I will, would like to remove. So on this very uh, fine, small scale, what I would like to remove is also the fact that kappa can be uh, different from zero, so that I have recollision. Okay, so uh, then I have to prove that the contribution of this, this term with the kappa, which, which is not zero, uh, is also very small. Okay, so, so that's very uh, simple when it's the, the conditioning. But I would like also to remove uh, kappa different from zero uh, before I iterate. Okay, and so um, there is one thing that I have to do is to uh, estimate. So now you see that essentially what I would have to do see if, if I do exactly the same thing here. So when kappa is different from zero, I would like to uh, to estimate this, this uh, covariance here. And so you see that if I use a cauchy schwarz inequality, what I have to do is to, um, um, to look at the, vari the variance of this field here and to prove that it will be small if, ka if kappa is not zero. Okay, so that's, that's what I have to do. Okay, and so here you see that they are, I, I will not do that because if it's really, really uh, technical, but I just would like to mention a couple of things about this. Okay, so about the control of free collisions. Okay, so that's, that's where the, the, uh, the proof is really different in terms of functional spaces than, than the proof of Lanford. So you see that in the proof of Lanford, what you have to prove is that essentially this, this, this uh, recollision 
have a, a small contribution in L1. Okay, because uh, you see that you just look at this this f, and then and uh, it's essentially what you have to prove is that they they will contribute, uh, they will have a small contribution in L1. Okay, and now you see that what you would like to prove is not an L1 bound, but a bound on the the, the variance of this guy, so which is more like a L2 bound. Okay, so that's uh, the first thing. So what we have to uh, look at is something like this guy. So when I say bad, it's just because uh, it has recollision. And what I would like to prove is that this guy, square, will converge to zero. OK? So the first remark is that uh, uh, this is uh, more complicated than proving the same for the expectation. Proving uh, the convergence of the expectation. Okay, now if you uh, remember how I construct this uh, this this uh, phi uh, bad, so I have this trajectory with three collisions. So there is uh, one geometric argument which tells you that essentially you have a graph if you represent the graph. Something like this. So you see that if you have no recollision, you have a tree like this. Okay, and so that's, that's okay, a priori that will be of the order of one. But now if you have a re recollision, so something like this, so here you have a recollision, you see that now you have a loop in this graph, okay, and this uh, implies very strong geometric constraints. Okay, because you, you have to remember that the size of the particles is epsilon, and so for two particles that you know to have a recollision, it's, it's, it's a very strong constraint. Okay? So what is important is that uh, uh, the geometric constraint associated to uh, uh, the loop uh, provides some smallness. So this part is really uh, the most technical part of the paper, and it's not really interesting. But okay, you have to compute everything here. Essentially, you gain something like epsilon. Okay. But so uh, because you have to estimate here the L2 norm and not the L1 norm, there is one thing that I didn't mention here, but which is really really important: that when you do the Duhamel formula, you see that you disymmetrize very much the system. Okay, because you say, okay, I look at this, this trajectory here, okay, and then this particle, number one, will be the first, set, number two will be the first which collide with one, then particle number three will have the collision here, and so on. Okay, so you see that by using this projection, actually you introduce a very strong dissymmetrization in your system. Okay, and this is not good, so in L2 you don't care, in L1 you don't care, but in L2 it's very different. Okay, because here you see that when you disymmetrize, essentially what, what you do is to introduce an order, okay, and then you, you completely, at, at this stage here, when you look at Zm, say Z2, Z3, Zm are not, are not symmetric at all. And so in all these things where you would like to prove, you know, law of large numbers, central limit theorem, and so on, the exchangeability is really something which is really, really important. Okay, so one thing uh, that you have to do is that before you uh, do all this, this estimate here, you have to go back here to this, this the, the way I define this phi and to symmetrize everything. Okay, so that's really something which is important. In L1, you don't care, okay, because this, this is really the same. You don't care about the, 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 um, the symmetrization. But here, I will not do the computation, but uh, just trust me that there is uh, a very, very important uh, Symmetrization of uh, the uh, forward flow. Okay, so the symmetrization is something which is really uh, easy. So you just uh, you just take your phi. Okay, as everything everything else is symmetric with respect to all particles, you just need to uh, symmetrize over all, all particles. So you just take one over factorial n. Uh, you just take uh, then uh, all. Uh, possible uh, permutation, and then that's fine, you have something symmetric. So apparently in L1, 
it doesn't change anything. But then when you compute the L2 norm, because you are, so maybe a, another way to explain why this, this symmetrization is really important is that actually when you symmetrize, you will touch, uh, say, a very different part of the phase space. Okay, so imagine that you have just, a, you are just in dimension two. Okay, so, and so by, by the, um, uh, by, uh, say, by, by the Duhamel formula, you obtain something which is not symmetric, so something like this. Okay, so you have that x1 has to be, I don't know, less than x2. Okay, but of course you say that, okay, but uh, then uh, it's uh, with an infinite norm which is like 2. Okay, what I say is that it's much better to uh, just replace this by the whole thing, so this plus this, and now I have 1 and 1. Okay, I just exchange x2 and x1. And you see that now, uh, if you ca compute the L2 norm of this guy, it will be less than uh, the L2 norm of this one. Of course, if in dimension 2 it's not very really different, but if you do the same in dimension n, then you get a factorial n, which is not, okay, when you would like to resum, it's not just a detail. Okay? Okay, so that's really, really important here. And I think it's, it's something which is really a, a bad feature of the Duhamel formula, is that uh, you have really this, this uh, important dissymmetrization. Okay, so if you would like to handle uh, the thing in, in, in different functional spaces, you have to retrieve this uh, symmetry. Okay, so um, uh, that's what I would like to say about the, uh, the time decoupling and the invert measure. So what I say, uh, maybe um, um, that's the, the way we control the remainders. And now I just have to uh, explain uh, more precisely all type of remainders. Okay, so that's the way. Actually, this, 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 um, you really um, need to understand this, this, this phi as, so essentially in infinite norm, they are not so, so bad, they are like mu epsilon to the uh, m divided by factorial m times a sum of, of just indicator function. Okay, so, so that's really important because we have this indicator function, it's really better to try to symmetrize uh, as most as possible. Okay, so now uh, let me uh, explain the iteration. Okay, because I, I'm not exactly, uh, so at the very beginning I said that, uh, so just looking at the covariance, I was interested in just pulling back the observable from T2 to, uh, to T1, and for the moment what I ma managed to do is to uh, pull back it from T2 to T2 minus delta, which is not exactly uh, the, 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 the thing that I would like to be able to do. Okay, so I have this, I have time, like this. So now I will call this T and zero, because it's not really important, that's T1 and T2. Okay, so now I have put back the variable here, t minus delta. Okay, and so what I said is that uh, you see that the combinatorics of the thing, because of the, the, um, the recollision index, can be very, very, uh, okay, if I, I, I don't care. Okay, what I get is that I have a kappa to uh, the power, say, a kappa to power number of particles. So even though the number of particles remain bounded, you see that I have a power of kappa here. But then if I just do uh, the whole thing one over delta times, I will have a constant kappa to the one over delta. If you remember that delta is just like epsilon, then of course you cannot do anything with this. Okay, so the first, the first sampling, so actually you have a sampling at scale delta. And here what you do is that you remove, so you do the iteration, you pull back. But then you remove all the contribution where the, the kappa is different from zero. Okay, so we remove uh, all contributions with kappa different from zero. Okay, so this means that, of course, you have a remainder term that you have to control according to the previous uh, um, strategy, okay, but you can have this kappa only for one small time. 
Okay, so maybe, uh, and then you, you just iterate, so you have t minus 2 delta, so here you have a remainder, okay, which is a, a phi recollision, which corresponds to this loop. Okay, maybe I should uh, call it loop. Okay, so this, this is, this, this will be small because of the geometry here. Actually, it will be of the order of epsilon, epsilon delta to the one half, but then you have, uh, you have one over delta of them, and so the total, okay, so, so this would be of order epsilon delta to the one half. Okay, but this, this, uh, then you are, will have one over delta terms like this, and so you see that you have epsilon so di divided by delta to the one half, but this is still small. Okay, because delta is a bit bigger than epsilon. Okay, so I ju just do that. I have another phi loop here. Okay. But then there is another problem. Okay, if I, so I can just uh, try to iterate these things. But you, you see that there is another uh, bad uh, behavior that I'd mentioned when we uh, did this, uh, this ser series expansion in the Duhamel thing, is that maybe you have also a growth of your collision trees, which is not admissible in the sense that it will be super exponential. Okay, so then you have to uh, introduce another uh, sampling on the time which is bigger, actually, because of course, essentially on the time delta, what you expect is just one collision. It's so you will, not, you will not be able to measure the growth of the, of the collision trees. Okay, uh, either you have one or you have zero, but it's something of the order of the unit. And so it's very complicated to control the growth on such small intervals. Okay, so that's too small to control the growth. Okay, so I, I need to introduce a time scale which is a bit bigger, which is tau. And this uh, sampling at a scale tau is to control the growth. So that's, so that's okay. So remove super exponential. Gross. Okay, so maybe I should uh, uh, just recall or say something about, about the. Um, so typically, what you expect is that, say, the probability of, of having, say, uh, m collision in, in this small time interval will be like delta to the m. Okay, so you see that, so it's not a problem with delta so small to sum for all possible m. Okay? Now for tau, okay, it's not a problem. If tau is still small, it's not a problem of controlling tau to the power m for any m. But you see that if I don't remove this super exponential growth, then for this big time here, I will I will expect that the con the contribution of of size of trees of size m will be like t to the m, and that's not possible to sum. Okay, so I cannot do that. I really have to uh, control the growth. Else, I will not be able to reach time t, which is much bigger than one. Okay, so that's really uh, I, I don't have the choice here to do that. Else, I, I have a divergence, which would be, say, if I do not, uh, else I would have a growth like kappa to the one over delta, which is not admissible. Okay, and if I do not do uh, this second sampling, what I would have is is a growth like t to the m, and this this is not possible to uh, sum. Okay, so I, 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 I cannot choose to do that or not do that. If I would like to reach big times, then I have to really to uh, truncate all these bad things. Okay, so maybe I can explain a bit this, this super exponential thing because it's not too complicated. Okay, so now I will have uh, all this time tau. Maybe I should have this one. Okay. So what I do is that, um, so I will have t minus tau, minus two tau, et cetera. And what I will ask is that the m, so the total number of particles that I've created by these branchings, will be smaller than, uh, so the total number of particles, so particles created, so that's the number, nk, created on uh, t minus k minus 1 tau, uh, say k tau, t minus k minus 1 tau. OK, 
Okay, so just remember that if you uh, uh, start with the the the, the, the so trajectory is like this, you have a number which is the number of branching in a tree. Okay, and so then I I have this on the first time here, and then I start with this. So this this will be n one, and then I will be I will have n two, something like this. So it will be of course bigger and bigger, but what I would like to do is to be able that, say, uh, this guy will not be more so that, say, the typical number of branching is not too large. And so what I will ask is that nk is smaller than 2 to the k, okay, which corresponds to the, 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 the exponential branching. Okay, so I will not explain all the details, but the idea here, sorry, there was a question. So the idea here is that, okay, if you have something like this, then you see that, say, the growth for the uh, the first time interval, okay, maybe maybe if you are quite far here, it will be something like t, okay, if if you are a good tree until interval k, okay, you know that the total number of branching during this 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 big time here. So imagine that I'm here. Okay, so here I have a, a, a large number. So what I know is that it's good on this this uh, first time interval. So it will be smaller than two uh, to the uh, um, two plus plus uh, two to the one uh, two plus two to the k minus one. Okay, so that's the total number of particles that you can create in all these 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 uh, uh, intervals here, if you are a good tree. Okay, so that's the cost of something like this is like t at this power. Okay, and this is, is essentially like two to the k. Okay, but now the if now you are bad in this time interval, this means that the total number of of branching here will be like tau to something which is at least two to the k. At least well, actually you 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 sum over all possible n which are bigger than two to the k. So essentially, it's equivalent to something like this. Okay, so now if you look at this this uh, thing, you see that it will be something like tau times t at the power two to the k. So you see that this contribution can be made as small as possible, provided that this this tau times t is less than one. Okay, so that's the way you control this this bad growth is to say that okay, I stop as soon as I have an interval here such that n k becomes larger than two to the k. So that's the second, and this sampling actually is uh, very uh, reminiscent from uh, the sampling in uh, Air de Chaniao. Okay, so I have this double sampling. Of course, it's a bit complicated because I have a lot of remainders, but but say the idea is always the same: is that essentially this 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 estimate here can be made in L1, but also in L2, and so I can control the variance. And so you see that each time is something which is it's really localized in time. And so I can just discard all these pathological behaviors. Yes. <coughs> About the collisions, I have a naive question. So it seems you are handling the collisions in two stages. First, you say that you don't have too many. And then you yeah. say that, uh, so is there a reason why uh, you cannot do directly uh, uh, just saying they don't contribute? Because you first say that uh, you have this conditioning that you don't have. Uh, because because you, you you see that this geometric thing, I'm just able to control uh, control it once I have already projected on on finite dimensional space. Because it's important that in this this maybe it's possible. I don't know. I actually, we are trying. We are currently trying to re rewrite everything without using all this two ML thing and for the trajectories. Just looking at real trajectories, and maybe it's possible to do that something like this. But uh, okay, so, somehow we are really biased by the fact that, say, the traditional way of of, uh, of doing all these things is to use this 2ML, and so to to control this kind of free collisions on 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 finite dimensional spaces. But maybe it's possible to do directly with the I don't know. Yeah, there there is you know <laughs> the weight of history is. <laughs> <laughs> of tradition in the SI. so it's it's complicated to change our mind maybe maybe it's possible just to do in one step i don't know yes for the time sampling you also use this trick of time decoupling and the cauchy schwartz so this yes. is also possible away from equilibrium now everything here so that's that's uh we we use this so for all of this we use this time decoupling 
So you see that I don't care at all of, say, the, 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 the fluctuation field at time 0, or if I do this with uh, higher moments, I don't care of this, this, this fluctuation field, this fluctuation field, this fluctuation field. I just say that I control them by other, and then I'm just concentrating on, on, this, on this pathological time where something bad happens. So it's really, really important that here that we have the invariant measure. What I hope is that, OK, maybe in the nonlinear case, you don't have a control with this elder, but maybe with, with something like an entropy inequality or, OK, that's the hope, but, uh, but OK, that's just science fiction. But that's important to have also a bit of science fiction. <laughs> okay, so sorry, this was a bit fast, but so are you ultimately saying that the probability of this super exponential growth is small? Yes. And uh, this was, as I said, it was just a bit fast. So did you say how, or did you just claim it? Uh no, I I say that that I can prove that this the contribution of all this is small, because so what I do is that uh, I each time I I reach a new interval of of the size tau, just checked if 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 the the thing is is nice, then I will iterate, else I will not iterate, and I estimate the term. And this remainder terms is of this order here. OK, so if I choose tau to be sufficiently small, of course, not of the order of epsilon, but you can imagine something like uh, uh, 1 over log or 1 over log log or something like this. You see that this, this guy will, will give you a geometric series. And so all this contribution uh, will be negligible. OK, so but. But you see that I, I will not iterate the whole thing. So uh, once again, I, I have no result on the correlation function because I destroy so many uh, contribution that in the end, I don't know. I, I, I cannot say something on the correlation function. OK, so I have still a bit of time to uh, try to explain the case of higher moments, and especially uh, this, how we get this fixed rule for, uh, to prove that the, uh, the limiting field is, is Gaussian. Okay, so what I say is that at this stage, if you just use all these arguments, so the duality plus the sampling plus the estimate of remainders, so one thing which is a bit technical is to, uh, to estimate the variance of all these bad terms, but okay, this is something that you can do, it's a bit uh, like computation. So what is not very fun is that you have also to take into account all these small corrections due to the spatial exclusion. So there is a bit of combinatorics here. But really, if you symmetrize uh, uh, the thing, use this kind of arguments here for the smallness, then you can prove that all these remainders are not uh, too big. And then you end up, you really uh, manage to, um, to have this, uh, this uh, iteration and just uh, uh, pull back the observable from t to zero, and then you see that you have the, the formula for the covariance. Okay, because then you see that you have all the uh, uh, the main terms of the Duhamel uh, formula. Of course, you can prove that the same uh, are the, the important contribution for the Boltzmann equation, and then you get uh, that the covariance will satisfy the, the linearized. Okay, so at the end of this uh, this part here, what you can prove is that. So uh, the covariance can be rewritten, say, is equal up to all these remainders. To, um, so you have the expectation. So you still have this, uh, this guy here, which has not changed. And then you have t type salon uh, m zero of phi m, okay. And so of course they, there is a sum. Now the m here is constructed by this iteration, so you know that it's uh, it's, it's sub exponential. And I will uh, add a zero here to mention that there is no uh, recollision here. And so what I say is that then you have the, the usual thing to compare the Boltzmann trajectories and, and the BBGKY trajectories. But you see that the contribution of the uh, super exponential m also in the Boltzmann expansion is small. OK, so that's, that's close to, so that tells you that you will satisfy the linearized Boltzmann equation. Uh, 
Uh, maybe I should have said something which is a bit like magic that I, I it, it took me a lot of time to realize that actually the BBGKY, so what I say that by this construction, what you obtain is something like the BBGKY hierarchy, okay, that's the solution. And one thing which is really, uh, uh, um, I think, a bit magic in this BBGKY hierarchy is that if you start with an initial distribution, which is just like a sum, because you see that in this, this uh, so here you, uh, you have that now your initial distribution come from this, this, um, this fluctuation field, so you have a sum over the of H1. Okay, so now the distribution, uh, the, the initial distribution is something like m to the n. So the, the projection on the uh, the n marginal times the sum from i equal one to n of H1 of the i. Okay, so you have to to understand the BBGKY hierarchy with initial data like this, and then instead of having the nonlinear Boltzmann equation, what you get for this kind of of initial data is the linearized Boltzmann equation. And this is an exact, another exact solution of the, BBG, of the Boltzmann hierarchy is uh, the, the, uh, our solution of this form where H is the solution of the linearized Boltzmann equation. Okay, so that's, that's kind of magic, I think it's. Okay, so that's, so at this stage, what you have proved is that the covariance is, is of the fluctuation field is the solution for very large time of the linearized Boltzmann equation. And of course, it's not enough to prove the convergence of the process. So you need two other things. You need a, a, some tightness. So this, I will not uh, go on this because it's just very technical. And I don't want to, uh, but OK, this is something that you have to prove. OK, it's not very different, but uh, OK, it's much more technical. So I Actually, you see that the tightness, if you can prove it on a very small time, then it's okay for, for a long time, so it's not really a problem too. So if you can prove the convergence of the process for, for small times, then the tightness will be the sma same for a long time, so I will not uh, comment on this here. But the other thing that you need is that to prove that the field is Gaussian, the limiting field is Gaussian, and so uh, you need to, um, to prove that uh, you have Vick's rule. Okay, so... So yesterday we had a whole uh, lecture by uh, Manfred on this uh, Vix rule. So here you see that it's uh, a bit different because, say, in, Manf in, in Manfred's lecture, Vix rule is what you assumed on your random uh, variable, okay? And then you use this Vix rule to say that some terms are zero and other terms are not zero. Here that's not this exactly the same, that's what you need to prove. Okay, so what I need to prove is that I have this uh, pairing rule uh, when I compute the, uh, the IP, so the, the moment of or the P. Okay, what I have to prove is that H1 that this guy, what I would like to prove is that this guy will be up to some small remainders, the sum of all, over all possible pairings of the expectation, okay, so then you have the covariance, okay? So, so we have to put two of them here. Okay, I, I will not write it, okay? Say I1 G1 Okay Say I and G Okay Okay so you, you take all possible pairings and you take the product of all pairs of the expectation of this guy Okay that's the just Vix Okay, so um, of course, usually when you have something at, at equilibrium, you just compute directly this guy because every uh, fluctuation field, all the fluctuation fields are taken at the same time. Okay, so there is no reason why you should do something uh, different. Okay, but here, of course, you see that it's much more complicated. So the way we will do that, it's also by an iteration. Okay, so here, uh, 
preparing is obtained also by an iteration. So that's the first ID. Essentially, there will be uh, three important IDs here. OK, so this means that so you had this, this complicated uh, sampling here with small interval of size delta and intervals of size tau. And now you have this interval of size tp minus tp minus 1. OK, so you have three uh, iterations, which are just um, uh, that you have to, to, to make together. OK, so that's a bit like um, horrible, but uh, OK, that's fine. The I in principle, the idea is not so complicated. OK, so um, um, for this, to realize this pairing, actually, uh, there, there is one thing which is really important is that uh, um, we will uh, try to uh, just pull back this fluctuation structure, as I explained for the covariance. So I will start from this HP, OK, at time TP. And I just pull back this until time T, P minus 1. OK? And then I'm happy because then I have at least two fluctuation fields at the same time. OK? So now if I have two fluctuation fields at the same time, what I have to do is to uh, just uh, try to understand whether it's still a big fluctuation field or not. OK, so that's what I would like to do. So I just want to explain one elementary step. OK, so, so this means that I have pulled back okay, of the fluctuation structure. between, uh, say, uh, time uh, tp minus 1 and tp, okay, on, on this, OK? And then at time tp minus 1, I don't know, OK, maybe I should, this would be simpler like this. I need to understand what was the structure now when I take the product, OK? And so here you see that I, I go back to a remark that I, I, I made at the very beginning when I defined this, this zeta m, okay? So the, 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 the definition of a fluctuation field, a, next, a generalized fluctuation field. You see that what something which was really important is that all the indices were all different. Okay, so that's the second idea here, is that now when you have the product of two fluctuation fields, what you would like to do is to decompose it as something like, which is still like a, a tensor product, okay, plus something which is a contracted product. And this contracted product will be exactly the expectation here, the covariance, okay? So that's, um, so uh, the second idea is to decompose a product in, a, say, a tensor and contracted product. And so I will just do uh, the exercise on, on, on just one, one uh, say, the product of just two uh, fluctuation field of, say, size one, OK? And but you can imagine that you can do the same. OK, so now what I have is something like this. So I have one divided by mu, the sum of h of the i minus the expectation of h, OK, and I have square factor mu, and then I multiply this by 1 over mu, the sum of g of z i minus the expectation of g. Okay, so that's ju just the, the, so now I just, I, I don't precise the time because it can be at any time tp, okay, I just look at this, the, the, at the, the, this product here, okay. So here I should maybe uh, call this. And so here you see that, uh, so the, man, the, the term which comes from this will be 1 over mu square. But then you have two types of, of terms. You have one term which is a diagonal term, which will be the contracted product of h of z i, g of z i. Okay, so this term will be uh, very special. 
plus 1 over mu square. Uh, then you have the sum from I1, I2, and now they are different. Of H of C, A1, G, C, I2. OK, and then you have, so here you see that you have minus the expectation. But then when you will take the expectation of this, you see that essentially most of the, uh, the term will uh, just, if I take the expectation of this guy, OK, you see that you have term. OK, so maybe I should write them. Okay. So you have minus the expectation of H expectation of G plus some other plus. So this is plus. And then you get minus the expectation of H times uh, so the, the empirical measure G and minus the empirical measure H. Okay, so what I say is that what is really important here is that you have this term, and this term actually is exactly the covariance. Okay, of course, if you just uh, compute everything, you get so you will so you will define the contracted product as this part of the product, and uh, the. Uh, tensor product as this part of the product, but then you see that this one is very, very good. You are very happy with this one because it, it will be exactly of the form uh, zeta 2. Okay, by definition, a zeta 2, a fluctuation field for a f uh, function of two variable, is exactly the difference between this guy here and the expectation of the product. Okay, so the way I have to do that actually is to do that plus 2, the product of the expectation. Okay, so this term I don't really care. So this one will be the tensor product. Okay, and what I say is that then I have really uh, this this very nice structure that is still. Uh, um, so of course the observable is a bit more complicated, but I still have this this structure of of tensor product. Okay, so what you do is that you see that if you do this iteration here, you see that each time you will so you will put back this guy. Okay. And so here, you see that you have two choices. Either you have the contracted product, and then you are really happy because, say, if you look at the, the scaling of this guy, of course, the mu here will kill just one uh, mu here. Okay, and so that's just like the empirical. So it's something of the order of one. Okay, and so only the expectation will be important because then the, uh, you have just fluctuation around this. But say the main term, the term of order of one, when you multiply by mu here, it's just the expectation of this guy, and so you get exactly the covariance here of the H, HP and HP minus 1. Okay, and then you have to just compute the rest, but they just decouple. Okay, or you, you have this tensor product, and then this means that essentially you have the same structure and you just can continue the uh, iteration. Okay, so that's really important that you can you realize that you can compute this. this is an exercise actually that you can do say just forgetting about the exclusion here but this is a way that you can compute uh, iteratively uh, Vick's rule for a product of fluctuation field okay but what is really important here is this decomposition in tensor and contracted products okay so I have not so much time so um, so there is still one thing that I would like to uh, uh, explain so which is the third argument here because here I've um, I was a bit cheating so I just would like to explain why and this is really important and it's actually connected to uh, all this cluster expansion and so on so that's I will try to explain in the remaining time this last argument Okay, so if I go back to the iteration, so then what I say is that I, I start from, from a time, say a TP here, I just pull back the observable, then, then I, I just decompose in one contracted product, and one in the case one of the contracted product, then I just stop. I just remove the expectation of this, this pair of, 
this contracted product, okay, I remove the expectation, and just look at the, the rest of the, the fluctuation structure without this two field HP and HP mi minus one. Okay, so that's fine. And the other one, then you see that I have a zeta two of something which is a tensor product. Okay, so I have something like zeta two of HP tensor HP minus one. Okay, so I would like to just pull back something like this and say that it's not very different from, say, a, a tensor product of these two, so of, of these two fluctuation field. Okay, so now what I would like to do is to uh, s see that I will keep this tensor product here. Okay, so I, have, I, I, I would like to say that when I will pull back this new thing, essentially I will keep the factorization. Okay, so the next, the, the, the last argument here is that when I use the pullback at leading order, okay, at leading order, the pullback keeps, say, uh, the factorized structure. Okay, so that's, that's actually you see that that's something that you expect. If you start with one particle here, just uh, put the tree like this. You start with another particle here, you just uh, put another tree here. And you see that you expect that more or less is true that it's the same to propagate back uh, these two particles or to, partic to propagate back this one and propagate back this one. Okay, so that's something that you expect. Okay, so you would like to say that it's the same to uh, pull back HP on the one end, pull back HP minus one on the, on the other end, or to pull back the, the tensor product here. Okay, that, that's what you, and actually if you assume that you have this, then this iteration is okay. Okay, you can do that, you can just, uh, okay, uh, each time you pull back, then, uh, then you uh, uh, separate the tensor product and the contracting pr product, and then you, you go back and pull back everything, and then, and then you find this Vix rule, okay? So if this, if actually the pullback was really keeping this tonsorized structure, then you, this would be the end, okay? Now, unfortunately, it's not true that the tonsorized structure is preserved. So of course, when you are just interested, and that, that's the, the question of the propagation of chaos in the Boltzmann uh, grad limit, okay? So you see that, so uh, that's the same as saying that uh, uh, at leading order, uh, the Boltzmann grad limit grad scaling propagates cow. Okay, so chaos is really uh, this independence between the two particles. So now I have Z1 and Z2, they are independent. I just propagate them back and then everything is independent. Okay, so if this, if this was true, then I would get the Vix rule without any additional work. Okay, now it's not true. So of course, when you are just interested in the covariance, you just propagate back one particle, so you don't care about all this. Okay, but now if you have this moment of order p, then you, you need to understand this. And actually the leading order is not enough because if you uh, remember well, uh, just because of the, the, the scaling of the, 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 um, the scaling of this, this fluctuation field, you see that you have a, a big power of mu in front of all this, of, of, of all this thing. Okay, so you cannot say that, okay, but, but the remainder is small, so I, I, I don't care. Okay, so the remainder is small, but you still have to care because, because of course, you have a very big power of mu. And so it's not clear that this, this small correction, this small fluctuation around, around the, um, the chaotic uh, thing will be uh, still remainders. Okay, so this means that you have to understand the correlation between uh, two trajectories like this. Okay, so that's the, the only the, the, the thing that I would like to uh, do in the remaining time, which is f five minutes, right? Oh, 10 minutes, perfect. Okay, so, um, so what about correlations? 
So what I would like to know about correlations is typically their size and how they will uh, change this, this uh, uh, transfer structure and will they re really uh, contribute in the limit. Of course, I, I hope that it's not the case because I hope that Vic's rule is true in the limit. But OK, so I would like to understand both their size, their structure, and how they propagate. OK, so actually, this, 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 uh, this correlation, we have studied them in quite details in a previous paper, just for a short time. But here, the, 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 the method of analysis will be the same. So actually, we can say very uh, precise things about these correlations and this cumulants, because uh, we can, for a short time, we can even get a large deviation result. So this means that not only at the level of fluctuation, but really for uh, for correlation, which are as small as you want, we can say something. Okay, so now uh, let me just check, uh, let me just explain where this correlation comes from. So uh, I will start with just uh, two particles, and I just uh, change a bit the uh, orientation of the picture just because it will be uh, easier. So now, th so time was like this, and now time will be like this. OK, and I just redo exactly the same picture. So, so the first reason why uh, these two particles uh, uh, might be correlated is that when you just uh, write, uh, just uh, uh, um, construct the pseudo trajectory backward, then maybe at some point th these two trajectories will cross each other. So you will have a recollision. OK, so that's the first reason why you can have a correlation is that, OK, you have something like this. And you have two particles and a third particle, and then you have something like this. And oops. Okay, so of course the particles which are created in the tree here say so that creation is independent of this, and the creation in this tree is independent of, of this tree here. But maybe because of dynamics, at some point they will touch each other and then they will be scattered. Okay, so that's the first reason why. You can have correlation. And then, of course, this is not true. You see that the, the dynamics here is not the same as if you just look at this, these dynamics, these dynamics, and just put them uh, uh, close to each other. OK, so you have this correlation. Yeah. So there, we, we only care if really Z1 and Z2 collide, or also? No, no. In, any particle in the tree of Z1 and any particle in the tree of Z2. But why does it impair the, the independence of the two particles if they're children? Because, because I, I just, I just uh, uh, what I would like to write, if you remember, is that uh, the phi I, I construct from this. So I, I just, uh, you know, I, I just say that uh, I pull back with the pseudo trajectory. And I would like to say that it's the same to pull back separately the two trajectories. So separately, the two observables. And so you see that the configuration here is not the same as the configuration of this one uh, taken separately and this one taken so separately. So in the end, they all end up in the initial data, or the, the arguments will be the children of all of them. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. And so you see that it's not true that I can say that it's the same as looking these two things separately. Because the, the, the configuration here will be different. And that's it. OK, so I say, OK, that's the first obstacle. But OK, maybe I can. OK, so you see that when I say that I will just discard recollisions, it's true that I will discard internal recollisions. So internal, so if I have two particles here, which uh, this, this recollision is not really important, I can discard it. OK, and that's typically that what I discarded when I just re say that I just consider the kappa to be equal to 0. But these recollisions here, I cannot discard them because they really change the structure of the whole thing. So when I look at moments of higher order, then I cannot discard all recollision, this external recollision, we call this external recollision. I think this is a terminology uh, introduced by um, Sergio and Mayo. So this external recollision, I have to keep them uh, uh, really in mind because they introduce some correlation between these two things. Okay, so because of this, it's not true that uh, um, uh, the uh, phi, uh, say, the, the pullback will be just a product of the two pullbacks, OK? 
So now you can say, okay, but uh, this this okay, still happens with uh, probability which is small because so imagine that you have no creation, then you see that if you have no creation, you have just have something like this, and you see that you have to uh, uh, be in a very small subspace. So what I can say is that in order that such a recollision happens, uh, this introduces a very strong constraint on these two particles. Okay, so this is localized in a very small set of so the size of which is typically one over mu epsilon. Okay, so that's that's, and here you see that all this this support condition of the the, the phi and so on. Okay, so this 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 recollision is is okay. The first obstacle. Now you can say okay. Now just let's consider the two trajectories w which have no recollision. Is it true that they are independent? And not, of course, if they do not have a collision, then it tells you that they are not independent because you know that they do not have a collision. Right? Okay, so you have two, two trajectories which have no collision, they are not independent because you know that they have no collision, so they cannot uh, overlap. Okay, so next you have a second obstacle, so this, uh, that's the first obstacle, this recollision. And now you have the second obstacle, which tells you that it's not true that being, say, having no recollision. So this is not true that it's independent. Okay, so if I would like to say that they are independent, what I have to say is that, okay, if I have uh, no overlap, then it's like being independent minus having an overlap. Okay, so now what I would like to write is that no recollision. So it's like being independent because, of course, you know that then they, they evolve, they evolve just uh, independently. Okay, okay. I know that they have no no recollision, so I can write the dynamics here. I can write the dynamics here, but still, this is constrained by the fact that at no time they should overlap. So I can uh, write something like this. Okay. So now I will have another contribution to the correlation of order two. And actually, it's really important because the covariance is exactly the sum of these two terms. Okay, so now the second, the second problem is this overlap. So you write this, you, you do your two trajectories independently of each other, but then you just move the whole thing rigidly, and then uh, you have an overlap. Okay, so this is really different because here you see that uh, with this recollision, you have some scattering. While with the overlap, so maybe you have something like this, but here with the overlap you have no scattering. This is just that you have two independent trajectories, but you move them rigidly until the, the point where they will just overlap. So you have no scattering. So the, 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 the dynamics is not modified. Okay, so that's the, the situation of overlap. Okay, so that's the case of two, um, two trajectories. So that's completely actually describes the defects of factorization. So what you can say is that actually when you uh, write uh, your uh, pullback, that's uh, the sum of just a uh, pullback of independent variables where everything is factorized, plus uh, small remainders, and the small remainders will be uh, uh, something which is of the order of 1 in L infinity, but which is supported on a set uh, which has size 1 over mu epsilon. Okay, so this, the size in L1 of this guy is like 1 over mu epsilon. Bo both guys, uh, that's the same. It's just a geometric condition. You see that at this level, it's not a problem of, say, the size of the set, it's just, just a, a matter of geometry, and you don't care that whether you will be. Uh, Reflected or not. Okay, so that's the case of two uh, trajectories, and then you have the case of many other trajectories. Okay, so maybe I, I should say also that if you have one recollision or one overlap, that this is the leading order contribution here. Of course, you can uh, do a second recollision here, but this one will not be important, and it actually it will not improve the estimate. Okay, so. Once you have at least one recollision, you really don't care that you have more than that. Okay, so the other one can be dealt with exactly as the 
case where kappa is different from zero. So as soon, so here you see that maybe I can just uh, 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 draw a, a graph from this. Okay, so here actually you have a graph. If you have two things which are independent, then you see that you have a graph which is not connected. Okay, so now you see that with this recollision or with the overlap, you have a graph which is connected. Okay, and wha what I say is that among all graphs which are connected, only the minimally connected graphs are important. Okay, so for, for, for the correlation of other two, what you obtain is, uh, so they are represented by graphs which are connected either by a recollision or by an overlap Okay, and what I say is that among all these graphs, only the minimally connected graphs are really, uh, say, provide a leading order contribution. Okay, so only minimally connected graphs contributes a leading order. So it's not so clear to, to know exactly uh, the contribution of, of, say, having one more recollision or two more recollisions. So it's not clear that you gain something each time. But what is clear is that you gain at least a little bit of something so that the contribution is, say, not uh, really important and you can just discard them. Okay, so you see that wh what is really important is the graphical representation of this. And you can even simplify a bit by just replacing the whole tree here with just one point. Okay, so uh, the simplified, the simplified representation in terms of graph would be to replace the whole graph here of one by just one point, and then you need uh, to have a connection here, which would be either an overlap or a recollision. Okay, so now you see that uh, I just I, I I want to compute you know, a uh, product of a lot of fluctuation fields. So I will not have just one star or two starting points, but P starting points. Okay, so then I have to do the same. Okay, so I have P starting points. And I can just replace the starting point, say, say that this guy will just rep represent the whole tree of one, two, until P. Okay, so now you replace a point by just the whole dynamics of the of the, um, the whole collision trees of this, this guy. Okay, and what I say is that, that uh, the, the clusters, so the cumulant of order P, okay, so I can classify all cumulants. Okay, so the cumulant of order P which is actually the, 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 um, the coefficient when you, um, when you uh, expand the the, the partition function, the, no, not the partition function, the, the exponential moments uh, at order p, then the generating series of order p. So what you obtain is that you should have dynamical correlation between all these points. Okay, so now I can just forget about the dynamics here. And what I say is that I should have a connected graph. So maybe something like uh, this, this, and this. Okay, and only minimal, uh, minimally connected graphs will be important. And so you see that the, the size of this cumulant will be like uh, 1 over mu epsilon to the p in L infinity norm, in L1 norm. But of course, then you have the, the, the combinatorics of all possible graphs, which is not so good. And so this, this will give you the, the factor of p. And if you forget to symmetrize the whole thing, then you will lose another factor of p. Okay, and then it's not good at all. Okay, so I will not uh, um, uh, say how you can say um, plug all this 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 thing in the previous part because actually that's what you have to do on each uh, uh, small iteration. Okay, so on each time delta, you have that this complicated thing. Okay, so 
so you have really to, to look at the iteration of this. So you see that because of this correlation, you will have packets of particles which are growing, and then you have to con con control all these clustering structures. So th this is one additional technical thing that you have to plug in the proof. But say, really, an, at, at first, um, say, to, to have an intuition of the proof, you should just imagine that uh, the pullback keeps the center of structure. Okay, so that's another thing. So what you have to do is see if you just go back to this uh, this uh, big picture. So maybe I, I will conclude with this. So you have um, three different scales. So you have the scale delta. So at scale delta, what you remove is just a uh, internal recollision. So or non-clustering. So the the one which uh, create a loop. So loop. You just remove loops. So that can be uh, loops like this or loops like okay. Then at time uh, tau, what you have to remove is both the super exponential and also all complicated clusterings. Okay, so at time tau you have to remove all big packets of particles and you just keep the standardized things. Okay, so all clusterings have to be removed at this time tau. And then you have the, uh, uh, the theta p, the tp here, tp minus one or tp, where at this time what you are doing is just to separate the contracted products and the tensor product, and then say throw away all the small remainders. Okay, so here you have to uh, just do this, this, okay, contracted and tensor product. Okay, so if you just add all these arguments just in the right order, which is a bit uh, a bit intricate, okay, and then uh, you end up with uh, the fact that you have the Vick's rule and that the covariance satisfy the linearized Boltzmann equation so that in the end the uh, Leibniz fluctuation field is the solution of uh, this fluctuating Boltzmann equation. And this for very long times, so very long being something like log log nu epsilon or things like this. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. So in earlier works you were using this, um, you have developed this time uniform estimates on the truncated correlation functions. Are they used still in, in this proof here or you completely managed to do without? So uh, you mean uh, the first paper in L2, right? Yeah, no, uh, we completely, so it, it was very specific, actually, I, I think this method here is very robust, but the one that we developed actually in 2D was not, somehow it's, I think it's a bit related to this, but it was, say, somehow a canonical version of this. And so in the canonical setting, you see a lot of other uh, uh, fluctuation, which are due just to the fact that you are not, so you have all this, 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 a correlation coming from the fixed number of particles. And so it was really important to control the partition function, so to have a bound on the partition function, which is not true in any higher dimension. And so, yeah, we completely, um, so that's really a totally different method. And I think actually that these papers can just go to the trash. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on, the, on the technical side, there is this uh, symmetrization here, which uh, allows you to gain a factor of n. Uh, yes. N2. Going back to the very beginning of the lecture, uh, with this uh, u squared and the explosion, I expected uh, at some point a symmetrization idea which would deal with the plus and minus terms, the gain and the loss. This and, and I didn't see no, actually we are not able to use, so the only way we are able to use the fact that there are plus and minus is the existence of an invert measure. So I agree that it's uh, really a pity that we cannot use uh, better than this, this science, but uh, say at the moment we are really not able to see any minus sign. So the only thing is that, of course, if, if, if you add only a plus sign, you would not have any invert measure. That's the only way we can today. Maybe, maybe at some point we will understand how to use these constellations, 
but at the moment we are not able to use them. There is no way to symmetrize the, the omega and the sphere. To the problem is that uh, actually everything is so you can symmetrize, but then you see that uh, actually that, that's exactly what you do to get uh, this uh, this cross section with the positive part. Actually, you you just uh, change one of the omega in minus omega, but then you see that you are not exactly at the same point. And anyway, everything is deterministic, so you see that you have no say. It's not clear how you can get uh, really averaging. So we just as an atom to use such a constellation on very, very small times of the order of delta. So, and that's another uh, a little bit different approach. So here we use all this dual iteration and so the trajectories, but at some points, actually that's something that uh, Thierry is trying to write uh, right now, is to use uh, real trajectories. And then on very small intervals, then maybe it's it's possible to, to, uh, to use a bit the constellations. But but yeah, for the moment, it's really something that we don't understand. So, uh, in order to stay reasonably on schedule, I think uh, the further questions can be answered in smaller groups during the coffee break, <laughs> which uh, should last until uh, maybe 11.35 or 11.40 to stay uh, reasonably on time. And we can sign the speaker again.